so you remember that beer commercial uh, for Dos Equis beer where it was it had the world's most interesting man? <laughs> I think he's sitting behind me. Uh, and not to put too much pressure on you, John, but, the, uh, <laughs> but he, John Piotti is current CEO, uh, president and CEO of American Farmland Trust. Uh, but just going, working backwards and coming to date, he has uh, several degrees from MIT, including engineering, public policy, and management. He was an elected official in the state of Maine where he worked his way up to House Majority Leader. Uh, he worked in community development in Maine and founded the Maine Farmland Trust and worked his way up there. And now he's landed as president and CEO of the American Farmland Trust. So a broad background, lots of insight. We look forward to hearing more from uh, John Piotti. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rob. Wow. The pressure is on. Well, it's, it's great to be here today. And I was asked to come and talk about congestion and its impacts, and I usually talk about farming, and the two are interlinked, particularly in this region, and, and that's what I'm going to draw your attention to. So we're all familiar with the, I'm getting a lot of, does it sound all right? Is it better like that? Is that better? Okay. Um, we're all familiar with the concept of congestion. We experience it ourselves when we're, we're driving around. And in this region, it also has a direct um, economic impact. You know, we'll be hearing later from Richard about, about the impact of congestion on one of your primary businesses here, which is, which is agriculture. Um, but the primary, my primary interest is, is not so much in addressing these, these impacts and identifying, but coming up with the, uh, the right solutions in response. And it's easy, it's very easy to think about congestion in isolation, right? If there are more cars on the road, the clear and obvious answer, um, at least on first blush, is often to build more roads. And indeed, that's been the typical view of these things. And but time and again, we've seen that that doesn't work. More roads and bridges lead to more cars and more problems. And the problems may be greater than you think, with uh, not only an impact on development, but an impact on the economy and on the environment that could be quite profoundly negative. And this is true in different sectors, but today I'm going to talk about the impact on farming and farmland. Now there's a myth out there that development pays for itself. And the organization that I run, American Farmland Trust, has conducted over the last 40 years about 70 different studies that have looked at the cost of community services. And it basically has showed varies from place to place, but the conclusions are pretty much the same. And that is that development almost always ends up costing more in services than it pays in taxes. And that is simply the sort of uh, municipal cost accounting approach to it. It says nothing about the broader economic impact of that kind of development or the environmental impact. Now, it's easy to look at this part of Maryland and think that some of the farms are struggling, development seems to be booming, and that suggests that, well, as much as we love our farms here, as much as they seem to still be a big part of our economy, maybe we have to resign ourselves to the fact that that isn't our future, that our future is our economic future, the smart economic future is more development, and fewer farms. Um, it's easy to be led in that direction when you look at some of the trends. But if you dig a little deeper, you might realize that it's not as smart as it might seem. The economic benefits that usually come from that kind of development are one-off, one-time, and support a relatively narrow portion of the economy. Whereas a farm economy is potentially an ongoing engine which can serve the broader community and can serve it ongoing year after year. 
AFT has never done a detailed economic study for this part of um, the country. We've done it in other places. But I would suggest that if we did do one here, and if there are any funders out there that want to provide the resources for that, we'd love to do one. But if there, we did do a study of that sort, I would think that it would show pretty clearly that an agricultural future in this region can also be perhaps your strongest economic future. But of course, we have to look beyond just economic impacts. We also have to look at environmental impacts. And if the solution to congestion is or appears to be more roads, it inevitably means more development, and that inevitably means the loss of farmland. And that is something that simply, as a society, we cannot afford. So let's look at the numbers. America at this point in time is losing 1.5 million acres of farmland every year. That's about 180 uh, acres of farmland every hour. That's three acres every minute. Now we clearly need our land to grow our food. So some people like me, when they hear those numbers, they're alarmed by them, and they should be. But others aren't that alarmed, and they have different reasons. They have different arguments why they're not alarmed. Some might say, well, technology is going to save us. We will continue to be able to grow more and more on less land. Or in the future, all of our meat will be grown in labs, and all of our vegetables will be grown in vertical farms. I don't have the time today to go into all of that, but it ain't going to be the way it is. Um, we are increasingly going to need our land base to grow the vast majority of our food, and our need for food is only growing. Some people will say, well, it's too bad if we're losing that much farmland, but you know, it's inevitable in a developed nation, and our food can come from somewhere else. Well, the truth is this is a global issue, and America is the nation on this planet with the greatest amount of arable land. 10% of all the arable land in, on this planet resides right here in America. I would argue it is our greatest resource. And we have to look at global issues and global solutions here. This region is obviously a big part of that because you have a vibrant agricultural economy and we can't afford to lose the land that we're losing. Now, I'd go even a step further. I just mentioned that a lot of people don't get alarmed that we're losing farmland fast. I will suggest that maybe we don't even have enough farmland today. Now, when I say that, people look askance. I say, well, of course we do. We're growing all the food we need. In fact, we're exporting all that food and the like. Um, but let me start by talking about what farmland does for us. It's far more than growing food. Farmland is about providing a number of essential services that we need as a society, many of them environmental services. So it recharges our aquifers, it purifies our water, it provides wildlife habitat, it provides a great amount of biodiversity, and increasingly, it is necessary for us to sequester carbon and combat climate change. It's now clear, it was a big study that came out just last year, the impact and the possibilities of farming as a solution for climate change have really not gotten much attention. But in the last year, a major international study came out and made it pretty clear that there is no way we can reach the Paris climate goals simply by reducing emissions. We also have to pursue what are referred to as natural solutions, ways of putting carbon back in the soil. And farming done right has a huge role to play. So I started out saying, you know, maybe we don't have enough farmland. And what did I mean by that? Well, what if we were managing all of the land that is farmed today following best practices that really allowed us to sequester a lot of carbon? What if we were at a minimum following good rotations, using cover crops, applying methods of reduced tillage, 
and the like. We need more land than we do today. What if we had adequate riparian buffers along all of our land to ensure that water quality was not impacted by farming? We would need more land than we have today. What if our goal was not just to grow food, but also have agriculture have a carbon neutral footprint? We go further on the ground to produce good environmental results. Maybe that involves taking marginal land out of production, allowing it to return to native prairie in the Midwest or woodlands in some parts of the East. If we did that, we would need more land. And what if we went even further and recognized that farmland is one of the few opportunities to actually sequester carbon and help counter some of the economic sectors that are inevitably going to produce emissions that cannot be completely removed. Then we would even need more land. How much land? Nobody knows. No one's ever studied that. American Farmland Trust is, is the holder of the best data that exists on land use in the United States. Um, and we don't have those answers, but it's the next phase of study for us. But until we do that, I can tell you the following. Um, long before we run out of land to grow all the food we need, we will run out of all of the land that we need to help restore our planet. So this is a critical, critical issue. Now, what does all this have to do with traffic congestion in Maryland? Everything. Because we need to look at the whole system and take local actions that respect how all this is connected. AFT is known in some circles for our um, iconic no farms, no food bumper sticker, and I always carry them with, uh, with me, so if you need, oh, I see they're on the table already. Good job, Lori, she's ahead of things. So the reason I wanted to mention this is because the notion of no farms and no food um, that's only part of it. Think about what you've just been hearing. We need our farms to do more than grow our food. We need it to restore our planet. So sometimes I've been thinking lately we need to augment this to no farms, no food, no future. And that's really what we're talking about. You know, our future is in our hands and in a number of small but incredibly important ways. And here on the Eastern Shore, the future lies to a great extent in what you do to think about these pressing issues of congestion and traffic and future growth. Your wise decisions can make the difference. Your wise decisions will determine the future, not just here, but I'd posit could provide a model for the rest of the country. We're really, really pleased as an organization to be part of this conference today. We see these issues are interconnected and we stand by to work with Rob and his team any way we can uh, to advance what you're doing for smart growth in the future of this region. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Very much appreciate those comments. Our next speaker will be Rich Hernandez. He's the Vice President of Transportation at Purdue. I, for one, am person, have a huge admiration for Purdue's trucks that always come out perfectly clean, and I know they take a lot of pride in that. But Purdue itself has uh, always been a thought leader, too, and out on the forefront of dealing with things like manure and climate change. And so very much looking forward to hearing your background. Rich has uh, had a varied background with PepsiCo, Target, uh, been with Purdue for quite a while, Naval Academy grad, local, has been across the bridge a few times. Uh, so please welcome Rich. Good morning. Everyone likes to eat, and what John had to say is a lot of what you're gonna hear today, except for it's a little more about the numbers. So as we look at our industry and we look at what's going on and we look at food, and I like to eat, I won't kid you, right? We're going to talk some chicken today. So 
when you look at chicken and you look at the Del Marva Peninsula and the whole peninsula and everything else, there's 605 million chickens on the ground. That's a lot of chickens. And you start to back into it and you say, well, that's just a chicken. So that's like 4 billion pounds worth of chicken. And then you start backing into that again and you say, hey, that's 5,000 chicken houses that support nine plants. And each one of those plants has employees that go with it. And there's about 20,000 employees that go with all those, those chicken plants. That's a lot of plants. That's a lot of people. It's one billion dollar industry just on the shore here. And when you start to break into it, about 700 or 800,000 of that is on the, on the chicken side itself. And then you've got the farmers getting another 300 million of that. And the farmers in, in doing that, and you start to look at it, you, you got to take a step back. It, well, that's not me. So when you take a step back, what do chickens eat? They eat, they eat corn and feed and, and soy and all sorts of things. So we had 93, bill, 93 million bushels of corn. And then you start backing into 41 bushels of soybeans. And then you got bushels of wheat. Okay, so now all of a sudden we start looking at it from a transportation perspective. How did that corn and feed and everything else get to the processing plant, the feed plant? And then from the feed plant it has to go out to the farm. And then from the farm the chickens have to go out to the processing plant. And from the processing plant, they got to go out to the customers. That's a lot of trucks. That's over a thousand trucks moving in a day. Okay, and you start to put that into perspective of everything else that we're trying to do. So we started looking at, hey, what can we do differently? What can we do? Because most of our drivers are paid by activity. Okay, they get paid by the miles. So you think they like to be in traffic? They're not making any money sitting in traffic. Okay, just to be clear about it. They're not happy about being there either. So what happens is we start looking at schedules. Can we run at night? Can we run at 8 o'clock at night? And start going from 8 o'clock at night all the way to 6 in the morning. You're still going to see our trucks. I was happy today on my ride across from Salisbury, but I didn't pass a single one of my trucks. And I was kind of like, all right, it's kind of working. Right? Because I know if I'm passing them, they're coming back, which is not a bad part of the day coming on this side of the traffic. But the other side to look at is, what are we doing to be safe? What are we doing to make a difference? We have all these trucks on the road that are, uh, and that's just not... That's just, I'm just talking Purdue now, okay? There's a lot of trucks on the road, and yes, they are awesome looking trucks, okay? And they're supposed to be, it's a premium product, a premium brand, premium truck, premium driver. So we added premium safety equipment to them. So they have the forward radar. So if they're on cruise control, they have the forward radar engaged, you pull them in front of them, guess what they do? Automatically slows down, okay? So when you start looking at traffic and everything like that, we kind of talk about the driver meetings. The part of thing they got to do is they're supposed to keep a buffer zone. So they got their buffer zone so they could be safe. It's 80,000 pounds driving down the road. It doesn't just break on an instant, right? You got to take some, some room to break these trucks. And as you start to look at that, their biggest frustration is they do everything we say, leave the safety zone. And what do you think the drivers do? There's room in front of that truck, right? I got to get in front of the truck. What's the other side of it? I can't be behind a truck. God forbid I'm behind a truck anywhere. Right? So now I've got to pull out, pass them, and get in front of them, and of course get into a safety zone, and then to go into that. We have lane departure, we have all sorts of other things that go on with it, all the bells and whistles that you have in today's vehicles, we have in all our trucks. We also have what's called drive cam. And drive cam is kind of a cool little thing. As you start to look at it, it shows the road in front of the driver, and it shows the driver. And you've got a split screen so we can play it back, and it takes eight seconds before and four seconds after any incident. An incident could be a hard break, it could be a swerve of the road, and it lets us know exactly what the driver is doing and exactly what the, the, the conditions of the road in front of them are, are happening. So you start to look at this stuff and we get these reports daily as they come through. And what are our drivers doing to be safe? And what are our drivers doing that we can correct behaviors for and to make a difference with the traffic? Because the last thing we want to do is hit those brake lights. Because we hit the brake lights, what happens to everybody behind you? They're all braking, right? And you hear the stories from the drivers. How many people are paying attention to the road? And they're focused on driving versus with that little, you know, their, their cell phone in their lap. Okay? And as we look at it, these are the kind of things that we're doing as a company, what we're doing as a transportation organization, to get ahead of it, to stay with it, and to work with it. So I look forward to any questions you have, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Rich. 
Our next speaker will be Steve Cahoon. Steve is uh, head of uh, infrastructure planning for the Department, Department of Public Works for Queen Anne's County. Steve has a number of his bosses here in the room, so I know he'll be on his best behavior. <laughs> but Steve has been around here on the shore for a long time, 19 years with Queen Anne's County. And really, Steve's been in a ton of different jobs, most different jobs around land use and infrastructure planning that are available in the county, and I know he's worked his way up and we've enjoyed working with him. So, Steve. Well, I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective. More, mine is going to be more of a little nuts and bolts and what the county's involved in and the county issues that we hear back and forth um, and how we're looking at congestion. Um, so when Queen Anne's County talks about congestion, we, we usually talk about two types of different congestions. We have um, the commuter congestion, which is our regular people trying to get back and forth to work. And for the most part, things go okay as long as there's no incidents on the bridge, as long as there's uh, contraflow is working, you know, th things are working out okay. But we're concerned about what's coming down the road. We see um, um, the projections for the increase in traffic. We see the projections for more trips down here. We see a 404 opening up Middletown Bypass. So we're very attuned to that and we're very concerned about where things are heading. And we're interested in all the different strategies that can be put in place to preserve capacity on the bridge and to preserve the existing roadways. So it's a very timely discussion here today. Um, the second type of congestion we deal with is beach congestion. And the beach congestion, it's here today, every Sunday, you know, we're dealing with it. We might have 60,000 people um, coming through uh, this county, through this corridor, um, every, every Sunday on, in the summer. Um, and backups are routine, 5, 10, tw uh, 15 mile backups are routine. And the Bay Bridge corridor is a unique place. You know, from the 5301 split across into Anne Arundel County, it's a unique situation. Um, we have high volumes of traffic. We have a bridge with only five lanes to work with. That's a unique situation. Um, we're dependent on contraflow on a regular basis. Um, that is a reality that we live with. Um, who remembers the first time you heard, oh, they're doing two-way traffic on the bridge? <laughs> okay, <laughs> now it's a way of life. Um, it's something that we deal with regularly. Um, and it's unique that contraflow only happens here um, at the Bay Bridge. Um, at, oh, it's the only toll facility where contraflow happens in Maryland. Uh, it's the only um, area where contraflow happens, uh, where it involves multiple jurisdictions. It's the only form of contraflow at, the, at a toll facility. Um, and it makes it a very unique situation we have to deal with. And it's also weather dependent, um, which makes it unique. Um, and so, we're looking at what makes a good transportation system, what, um, um, how can, how, what's the impact, what's at stake? What's at stake if we have a good transportation system is we have good travel times, consistent um, deliveries, we have reliability, we have efficient use of, of our roadways. What's at stake if we have a deficient transportation system. We have unreliable travel times, we have delays, we have extra emissions, we have air pollution, we have um, all different things and it makes the, the transportation corridor look like a barrier. So if we have a good predictable transportation system, uh, we, have a, we have a reliable delivery times, reliable system. If we don't, um, the Bay Bridge corridor is, and the Bay Bridge is looked at as a barrier. And we've had a good transportation system over, over the years. Um, and that good transportation system has created a lot of good interdependent relationships between the Eastern Shore and the Western Shore. Um, jobs and employment were dependent on each other. Access to medical services were dependent on each other. Business opportunities were dependent on each other. Um, tourism and recreational opportunities were dependent on each other. The movement of freight to markets were dependent on each other. Um, access to the state government, access to colleges, universities, we're all dependent on each other. But as volumes increase on the bridge, the reliability of the travel times decrease, that then the um, perception and the reality of the Bay Bridge being a barrier to business, to economic development, to economic impact is, is very real. 
So what's at stake with jobs and employment? Eastern Shore residents depend on the jobs on the Western Shore, and the Western Shore depends on the Eastern Shore for a workforce. That's a reality of today. 60% of our residents commute uh, from Queen Anne's County, and then there's a lot of other Eastern Shore counties that depend on that commuting uh, for, um, for good jobs. Um, in, at some point in the future, they're going to have the option. You know, employees are going to have options of, do I sit in traffic? Do I relocate? Or do I take a different job over here at a different, at a different pay rate? Um, that's a reality that, that will happen as congestion increases. Um, we even have issues with Eastern Shore to Eastern Shore jobs. We bring a lot of people in from um, Talbot County or Caroline County to work here in Queen Anne's County. The Sunday congestion, if they run into, if they come out heading to work on Sunday, they hit traffic congestion related to the bridge, they'll call in. You know, we have, we, we have uh, employers here in the county that regularly have employees calling in because they can't get to work because of Bay Bridge traffic um, tr uh, trying to get across the bridge. Um, our access to medical care is vital. You know, we have some of the best medical care in the country right across the bridge. We need to be able to access it. Um, they need our access, they, or our customer base. You know, they, they depend on um, the residents of, of the Eastern Shore. Once it starts to take two and three times as long to get to that uh, medical facility or to get to that care, we're going to, you know, the Eastern Shore starts looking at different options. Users start looking at different options. You know, instead of going to Baltimore, they're going to look at what the alternatives are, and it's going to be out-of-state alternatives. You know, this, this corridor has created these interdependent relationships to keep a lot of the business, a lot of the dollars, and a lot of the value in the state. So, um, what's at stake? Uh, th those industries and those businesses moving out of the area. We're also dependent um, on the hospitals on the Western Shore. We don't have hospitals in Queen Anne's County. Caroline County doesn't have a hospital. If you have an accident here, our emergency services has to decide whether to transport you across that bridge. They have to look at that situation and see if they can get you there. They also have to look at, um, is, it, is it easier to go to Easton or, or what's an alternative? And, at, and as healthcare changes and it becomes more regional, having that connection to um, that health care uh, remains very important. Um, and then the Delaware health care. You know, we're going to, if, if we can't get across that bridge, Delaware may be the big, biggest benefactor of that as we search for other markets and other um, opportunities. Business opportunities, um, if that bridge is perceived as a huge barrier or a, a barrier, if a bridge business is looking at relocate, they're going to think twice about what, whether they're going to be here or at a different location. A new, a new business located, it's very competitive and it's very hard to get them here. Um, and a lot of people are, are working to get that business at their location too. If we have a congestion problem, it's going to be that much more difficult to locate them here. Um, tourism and recreational opportunities. We love that a bunch of people from the Western Shore come to the Eastern Shore and spend their money. We're dependent on that. A lot of the uh, little Eastern Shore towns that are fighting to survive and fighting uh, are fighting for those tourism dollars. If the congestion on the bridge continues to build or in this corridor continues to build, you know, people are gonna look at their options. If it takes them two hours or three hours to come to a destination over here, they have a lot of options where they can end up in two or three hours. If you're looking at people going to the beach, huge investment in trying to get people to a, a Maryland beach, so Maryland receives the benefit of that. If you have the congestion, they're gonna look at where, what other opportunities they have. If I go up and around the bay, I might end up at a Delaware beach instead. You know, there's a lot of different uh, impacts and if the congestion will send the money out of the area. Uh, movement of freight, same thing. People will start looking at different markets. Um, they will start looking at other opportunities. Um, and to some extent, businesses already have. Um, they're starting to change their habits on how they uh, commute and cross the bay. So, just a reality. Um, property values. As, property va as, as congestion builds and people look at options and people look at living in different places and people look at moving over here, 
property values will be impacted. That will impact tax, tax dollars and revenues. Um, when they did the redacking of the bridge, we saw an impact. Our real estate markets and our real estate brokers told us that, that they saw a difference in this market than other markets on the shore. And that's that bridge being a barrier to, uh, to our economic viability. Um, so we're open to every option. Queen Anne's County continues to put options on the table. We continue to uh, talk to MDOT about a lot of different opportunities. And it's easy to talk about them, but we have to remember that those roads are MDOT's roads. They're the state of Maryland roads. We'd like to be able to pull triggers on a lot of different projects to look at a lot of different things, but you know we have to work with MDOT and through MDOT. Um, Contraflow, as I mentioned, is a very vital part of preserving and protecting capacity on the bridge, which we're very interested in. We think looking at the contraflow, the efficiency of contraflow, look at the data of contraflow, how that can be used um, uh, more efficiently and effectively uh, could help us in, for a long time uh, preserving capacity on the bridge. Active management strategies, can we look at this corridor in a different way because it is unique? Can we put some rules in place and some strategies in place that we can manage the flow of traffic through here differently? Um, we think we can, we think we should. We think it would be responsible to do that. And we think it would help preserve the capacity on the bridge for a long time. You know, we, we support transit, we support um, uh, car sharing, we support uh, all the different options that you'll hear today about how, the, that are in place that, on how to preserve capacity. Um, and we're open to hear any other ideas that are out there. So I look forward to uh, answering any questions later. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to all the folks from Queen Anne's County, the commissioners that are here. Queen Anne's has really been a great supporter of this effort, and uh, they're knee-deep in it every day, and it is, uh, it is a big deal in Queen Anne's County. It's ground zero for congestion right here. Our last speaker on this panel is Dan Nataf. <laughs> he's the, uh, he's got a PhD in political science and he's head of director of the Center for the Study of Local Issues from Anne Arundel Community College and he's been doing uh, lots of polling around this issue so we'll get uh, an opinion on some consumer trends from the other side of the bridge. Thanks Dan. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I, it's a rare day when I get to speak to anyone outside of Anne Arundel County about polling that's done inside Anne Arundel County. And so uh, either I'm a fish out of water or maybe some of the things that I have to say are transferable in a general sense. So what I'm going to do, I mean, I'm a data intensive kind of guy. I know people's uh, eyes glaze over when they look at tables and graphs. I will walk you through it so you can listen to me and maybe see something else while we do that. Hopefully you understand how this thing works. Yes. All right. So the, the center uh, has been active in doing polling for nearly 40 years. I've been heading it for 25 years. What we do is uh, nowadays, in order to get at people, we have to do multi-mode kinds of polling operations. That means we both do calling as well as develop a web panel. So we are able to reach out via email to have people uh, chime in on our polls as well as having students call. Uh, as you can see here, um, our, the number of completions we get is something around 600, at least it's been uh, reliably so lately. Um, the margin of error is around 4 or 5 percent and uh, we obviously have to wait uh, the sample in order for us to get any meaningful results. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, given my 10-minute time really quickly, uh, is uh, the general question we ask that leads off every survey. Uh, these are surveys we do twice a year, and uh, these are kind of subsidized by the college, so there's no client or sponsors doing this other than the college. We ask, what's the most important problem facing Anne Arundel residents? Um, I will show you what the results are and to what extent transportation kicks in. I try to blend together uh, gr concern over growth and development, transportation and the environment, and put that into a cluster and compare it to other things like uh, crime uh, and or, uh, well nowadays it's crime and drugs, or uh, education and, and the economy and taxes and, and show you how the clusters compare. 
Uh, I have a lot of stuff on traffic congestion. We've been asking about that for years, and I'll show you both some of the more recent data as well as the historical data. We have something we just did, and I'm on the panel mostly because Darius saw my last uh, poll, which had a bunch of questions about the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and uh, alternatives and so forth. Uh, I'll tell you why anything you want to do that costs any money is not politically feasible. And then finally, I'll close by telling you, you've got some real governing challenges. All right. Okay, this first chart's a messy chart, and I understand that, but let's see if this thing works as I... Okay, so what we have, that's the, trans the number of people who say, uh, I have the biggest problem facing Anne Arundel County is transportation. It's, you know, it's, it's there around 8 9%. It's pretty reliably there. Um, this uh, big line here is the crime and drugs. Um, at least two-thirds of it is drugs alone. And so ever since the, I have a chart that shows you a better uh, a time frame or time series. Uh, and this is taxes, once very important back in uh, fall of 14, has fallen. And so let's look at the clusters. All right. So this is, it goes back here to spring of 09. We do these fall and spring. And at that time, uh, taxes in the economy were overwhelmingly uh, the issues of the moment. This was kind of one year into the Great Recession, so everybody was focused on that. We get into this transition period uh, around 2015 or so, where there's a really rapid slide in the saliency of the economy and taxes, and so necessarily other things are going to go up. And so one thing that goes up is this crime. You see the spike particularly there around 16. And here, before, uh, before that spike, there is this cluster of transportation development and environment. And so nowadays, what we see is those two are the leading issues in Anne Arundel County and have supplanted uh, concern over the economy. All right, so uh, one of the truisms uh, that I guess is easy to to address is uh, how long have people uh, been pessimistic about traffic congestion? And the answer is forever, right? Um, so we look back, uh, I had a question, is the county doing the better, the same or worse, reducing traffic congestion in 2002? Uh, yeah, two, 8% said better, 66% said worse. Uh, we're jumping up here to just the last six months ago, well, the numbers don't change, uh, except maybe they're getting even a little worse, right? Uh, yeah, we asked a couple times back in the early 2000s, think about the year 2010. Do you think that uh, we'll be able to do a better job of reducing traffic congestion? Absolutely not. Uh, both times, it's pretty convincing that the, the public simply has no faith in government's ability to handle this issue. All right. Um, and uh, w one way of juxtaposing this compared to other questions, right, other possible problems that counties have. So uh, you can see here, improving the local economy uh, has gotten better, right? So that's a pretty optimistic tone, and that, of course, corresponds to the improvement in the economy and the decline of it as, a, as the most important problem that I mentioned before. Um, so as you go down near the bottom, what do you see? Managing growth. Uh, that's one of the not too many gotten betters. Poverty and homelessness, but there's traffic congestion. So uh, you can see that it's an ominous uh, uh, projection about how uh, consistent people have felt uh, that traffic congestion. I also have a few things that I've asked about uh, generally, has Anne Arundel County done a great job with maintaining its roads? No, not really. Has Maryland got a very effective uh, transportation uh, system? No, not really. Um, all right, so. When we ask uh, the public, uh, what are your priorities, as high, medium, or low, and we list a series of different um, kinds of mostly capital projects. Rebuilding or replacing roads, servicing your community uh, is up there right next to schools, right? And then public transportation is right below it. Everything else, or placing, uh, you know, police academy, we did that, and uh, other things, libraries and so forth, are lesser priorities. All right, so uh, if we focus just on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge issue, uh, this I just did, right? Um, and so uh, the first uh, option is, uh, if you probably don't know uh, Senator Ed Riley, but he was envious of the fact the Eastern Shore is able to 
uh, wrangle a kind of veto. He says, why don't we get one too? <clears throat> I don't think he got it, but there was a slight plurality there in favor of doing so. Expanding the current Bay Bridge so it can handle more traffic, right? Uh, Two-thirds of the public on my side think that's a great idea. Right? Uh, I, can, I can't imagine how we're going to do that after the morning seance. Everything costs so much, but all right. Increasing bus services. That's even more popular. So this is from the Eastern Shore of Destinations in Anne Arundel County, D.C. Metro. That's really popular, right? Building a commuter rail on 50, uh, Eastern Shore with a stop in Annapolis. That's really popular, right? And so anything you suggest uh, seems like, why not? And so I think that the general attitude is do something, uh, just don't do nothing, all right? Um, and then finally, let me also say here, uh, you'll see I'm going to pitch uh, the, the cost uh, problem in a minute, but that's the theory of why don't we kind of increase uh, gas tax and pay for, and I say road, road improvements and transit, not uh, a great idea. Uh, how about if we increase tolls during peak summer hours to avoid traffic jams? Um, I haven't heard that mentioned as an option uh, today, a lot of other things. Maybe that's because you already know that no one wants that, right? And so, you know, shades of the ICC. All right, so uh, when we look at various uh, financing improvements, the first thing I want to show you is the consistency. I ask this uh, in different ways at different times. Uh, should counties uh, themselves try to throw on a sales tax on gas? How should the state do it? No and no is the answer. Should we increase, this is all the way back to fall 11, increase the toll on the Bay Bridge from 250? No. Uh, how else are you going to pay to replenish the transportation trust fund? How about a new tax on ownership of vehicles uh, over my dead body? Incre increase the state's property tax. Look what it would do. Uh, yeah, same answer. Okay, tax the rich. <laughs> right? Uh, why not? There's some deep pockets, right? This, in, this is corporate uh, business tax, right? Corporate tax. But I just asked another one where I just played with uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, theory of putting a 2% uh, wealth tax on uh, states over 50 million. Got 59% favorable, right? So as long as it's somebody else, there it is. Well, I see my time's up, and so I'm on my conclusion page. Uh, my only point here, I guess, is that uh, the public wants solutions. There's a political cost for uh, inaction, and it has a lot to do with the legitimacy of government and the faith that people put into you. But then again, I don't have much faith that the public itself wants to help uh, politicians out much. And so you might have to rethink the whole development scheme, uh, sustainability of this project of Eastern Shore interdependencies if you haven't got a way of kind of finding a solution paying for it. That's all I have. Wow, thanks, Stan. <laughs> Very difficult issues. I'm going to ask a favor. John, do you mind moving your chair just so I don't have to block you? And, and I am being given some questions. So, so folks that have questions, write them down. Darius or Brian or some of the other staff will be around to pick them up. Um, and we'll keep this going as fast as possible. First of all, thank you all for your comments. Very enlightening. It just highlights how difficult an issue, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, especially in Queen Anne's and Anne Arundel County, but very, very difficult issue with very few easy answers. There's no low-hanging fruit in this conversation. So first question. The question is, how is Bay Bridge congestion unique in relation to congestion in other areas? And I wonder, I don't know that we have the right panelists. Anyone want to take a stab at that? What? Steve. Well, I think, um, you know, kind of some of the things I was trying to point out in that the corridor is, um, there's no alternative routes. Um, if, you're on the, if you're on a beltway and you have a backup, you have congestion, you have alternative routes, you can get off, you can uh, go around it. This corridor, you have to either, if, if you have congestion and it's blocked, you have to go up and around the bay. I mean, the alternative is huge. And if you have congestion in this area, um, you don't have an alternative. You sit and wait. 
Yeah, I think that's right. That is a unique situation. Maybe makes this more frustrating than most places. Uh, another question for Steve. Uh, the improvements to Delaware Route 301 into Queen Anne's County, uh, or excuse me, into Delaware out of Queen Anne's County. We've got to get some penmanship uh, things straightened out here. There's 16,000 vehicles, <laughs> which more than, more than half are trucks per day. So the increase, I'm assuming this is about the new transportation, the new road up in Delaware around Middletown and what's that going to do to uh, issues on our Bay Bridge and is there anything that can be done about that? Any well, comments, Steve? Um, yeah, the county's invested a lot of money in a traffic counter program to monitor um, the impacts of that, of the Middletown bypass. Um, we're very concerned that it's going to divert trips off of I-95 um, up where if you're going from Christiana Mall down to Washington DC and you look on Google Maps or you look on Waze the the difference in those routes is not that much you know you have difference in tolls and we're, we're concerned that um, I-95 diversion traffic is going to start using that corridor and once they find out it's a very nice corridor to use um, what it'll do is get uh, traffic to the bridge quicker. Um, similar concerns about 404, the added capacity there um, uh, will work to get, get trips to the uh, bridge quicker. So we are concerned about it, we are watching it, we are monitoring it, we bring the issue up with uh, Maryland Department of Transportation every year uh, during our tour mm -hmm. and talk to them about uh, what they're doing about it as well. But are the numbers showing up yet? And is there increased numbers, uh, increased at, at, vehicles so on, on 301 based on that improvement? Um, we hear a lot of people saying, yes, there's more traffic. It, it was first fully opened um, in January, and we are seeing tri trips tick up. But we have uh, numbers for January, February, and March, so it's too early to say it's a, a, a pattern. But uh, we fully expect to see that, and we're going to uh, monitor mm -hmm. it for the next two years and respond accordingly. Yeah, if you haven't done it, drive that route. It takes really 15 minutes off the trip up around Middletown, at least 15 minutes, and it's high speed. It really, the distance from here to Philadelphia is now an hour and a half, maybe. It's really, it's pretty close. It's shrinking the uh, Mid-Atlantic pretty considerably. It's a question for Rich Hernandez or John Piotti. Uh, how have you had to adopt to the impact of Bay Bridge traffic? How much does it cost you? So I guess that's a question for Rich Hernandez. So from a cost perspective, the, the traffic itself, for every minute that we don't drive, it's a mile we didn't drive. Okay, so when you start looking at DOT and hours of service and all the new rules and regulations that we're up against, we only have a finite number of hours. So if I have to spend two hours in traffic, I lost 120 miles. I lose 120 miles, that's almost two-thirds of a person's day, or a third of a person's day, that they can actually physically drive and do something. So for us, I haven't put a dollar to that specifically, but that's the impact of it. I'm losing 25% productivity just sitting in traffic. And that's mm. why we had a route around it. Mm. That's tough. Thank you. Question for John Piotti now, and this is more of a good luck. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a growing number of farms on the eastern shore are taking farmland out of production and converting their land to large solar arrays. On the one hand, it benefits climate change and water quality. On the other hand, it further reduces our ability to grow food, especially over the long term. Do you have any thoughts about that balance? Well, the, the word that's used there is balance, and that's probably the right balance, uh, or the right word to use. Um, the beauty of farming is that it is one of the few areas where you can uh, truly meet a uh, production and an environmental bottom line at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not always necessary to, uh, you, can, you can still be growing food while serving the environment. Having said that, there are instances, depending on the landforms, depending on the practices, where the only solution for the right environmental impact is to, is to cut back. And one of the, but that doesn't necessarily, cutting back on production doesn't necessarily mean cutting back on profits. Um, when you're using a smaller amount of land, you can potentially switch crops, you could uh, have value added, you could do other things. 
So a strategy that actually works for some farmers to be more profitable is to produce less, but produce differently. So it is a trade-off, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a trade-off in the viability of the farm. Okay, thank you. It's a question about induced traffic. So it really relates, John made this comment in, in your remarks about when you build road infrastructure, you make it available, all of a sudden demand goes up because more development happens and more people can use it up. So uh, here's the question. It, anyone could volunteer for this one. Um, how long does it take for induced traffic to once again lead to more congestion after increasing road availability? So it's a general question, but if there's any trends or if anyone understands how that dynamic works, I'd love to hear it. Anyone? Yeah. Steve? Well, I think uh, we experienced it here uh, with Reach the Beach. Um, when all the traffic lights came off of Route 50, and I mean, everybody remembers that and trying to get across the Kenton Air Bridge and you looked at your watch to make sure you wouldn't hit, hit it when it went up. Um, when the uh, roads were wide, the lanes went in, we saw a tremendous change in the capacity available. And so that was in the 80s, um, early 90s, when the improvements were going in. And in time, we have you know, caught up to that. But for us, it's been since then, and now we're looking at where congestion is today. And um, you know, that's just a real life example of what we live with here mm -hmm. and the amount of capacity it gave us for a long period of time mm -hmm. um, before uh, the, the traffic volumes caught mm -hmm. up with it. Well, just following up on that, Steve. So after Governor Schaefer's reached the beach and getting the new Kenton Ayers Bridge, getting the lights out of the way, how long was it before congestion became a problem again? What, do you have a sense? That's I know it's gradual, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 10 um, years or? No, before it became a problem. Today, you know, we have some commuters. Our commute's not as bad as some other places. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, and everybody has a different opinion on how bad the traffic is or, or what, what the issue is. But I mean, we still have capacity from that improvement. Um, we're still looking, but we are concerned about how, how it'll be used up. All right. Hmm. Let's see. Do you think that greenhouse gas emissions and impacts of sea level rise should be studied as part of the NEPA process? I don't know, do we have any people want to take on the NEPA process? An anyone in the audience? <laughs> All right, we'll let that one pass. Um, I know a little bit about the NEPA process, but probably not enough to answer that question about where the sideboards are. But I think a lot of the folks on the Eastern Shore, that's the question folks want to hear. These studies tend to come up, you know, what is fair, can ferries work, can uh, some other solution work, bus rapid transit, things like that. And um, the larger context seems to be lost about long-term mobility. So, and long-term mobility and future carbon limits and, and things like that. So I'm hoping that uh, this conversation today and this afternoon can get into some of that. Um, question, what strategies today, and we're gonna get into this more this afternoon, but I'll open it up for some early comments on that. What strategies, strategies do you think could help congestion today? So maybe, Dan, I don't know if you have a sense of that from your polling. Well, I would say anything that doesn't cost money. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, again, all the things that you can do, ride sharing, all the things that facilitate more efficient use without it adding cost are the, the, the course of least resistance, right, mm -hmm. from the polling point of view. Yeah. Right, so maybe toll holidays we keep hearing about. Instead of con increasing tolls at some time con during congestion, as some people would oppose, decreasing tolls at off-peak hours to encourage more use there. That's, that might be some low-hanging fruit, and we'll talk about that more this afternoon. Anything else from the panelists on that? This one's for anyone. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dan, this is a public perception question, but what's the tipping point? What does when does traffic become too much and what does that look like? Anyone want to try that? 
I mean, I, I would say in the beach context, what, you know, at what point does the traffic congestion get so bad that people no longer want to invest in condos in Ocean City, things like that? Anyone have a sense about that question? Well, I think uh, for this corridor, um, you know, routine delays on sun, summer Sundays, uh, we, we see uh, congestion, we see it impacting jobs, we see it impacting people being able to get to work. Um, it, it's a tough situation right now. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I will say personally that um, I think the human capacity for suffering is enormous. <laughs> <laughs> and I only say that to me, I'm on the Eastern Shore, my job's on the Eastern Shore, I'm rarely crossing that bridge for business purposes or sort of under duress, like you got to get to work or you miss punching the clock. So if I get in a traffic jam, it, it's like, it's a big deal to me. I let it get to me, I think. And, uh, but my wife, she's one of the Queen Anne's County workers that commutes across the bridge every day. And she gets in traffic jams, unpredictable, mostly predictable. I would say, but if unpredictable traffic jams like yesterday, we were both on the western shore and won't talk about that incident, but it was, uh, it was, it was all backed up in both directions, it was a mess. And, um, but she has this, she's just used to it, doesn't bother her, it's a part of her, part of the cost of doing business, part of her life, and uh, she's amazingly patient with it. So. That's, I think this is a key question. What are we all willing to pay to get rid of that problem is, is a real question. And it's, uh, it's worse for some than others, but I think our capacity to endure uh, pain and congestion, we'll grouse about it, you know, but our, like my wife's, she's not gonna give up her job over there. We're a long way. It's going to have to get a lot worse before she gives up her job. I would say that just as a personal anecdote, not to take the floor. So who knows what the uh, tipping point. Uh, question for Rich Hernandez. Given the importance of our poultry industry to major markets like Washington, Philadelphia, Wilmington, isn't preservation of Eastern Shore Farms crucial to the industry's future? Absolutely. Absolutely all the feed and everything else that we have that supports the farms. So it works for both the agricultural basis that John talked about earlier. You know, you have the farm, you have the feed that creates the chicken. That is 90% of the cost of a chicken is the feed. So if corn prices go up, you know your chicken's going up, right? So it's all related together. So it, it definitely has an impact on it. And do you depend on grain from outside the region to feed the chickens? On Delmarva, let's say. It's 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 consistent. So where where our weather patterns and everything else is part of what we do to live here and work through there. So when we have a lot of rain and all of a sudden it affects the farm and then it affects our growth pattern, it affects you know the, the, the plant rotations, it affects everything. So it has it definitely has an impact on it. And if you need more feed for the chicken industry, does it come in via road? Let's say there's a bad growing season here but good in the Midwest. It comes you... by road, it comes by barge, it comes through every way we can get it. Okay. Hmm. Including international. No kidding. Hmm. Question for the panel. Would additional studies on congestion management techniques on the bridge be helpful? Anyone? Yes. 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 <laughs> Any, anything in particular? <laughs> you know. I think that's why we're here today. I think looking at all the options, everything uh, on the table to preserve. I mean, we're looking at 15 years or 20 years before any bay crossing would occur, if it occurs, and uh, we need to do everything we can. Uh, thank you. I think this is a more difficult question here, but questions about um, land use. And we, I don't know if I can, can't quite read the, uh, text, but the general gist is development, we're allowing development on both sides of the bridge uh, without consideration for the increases to congestion. So the external, there's externalities of local development decisions that impact that transportation infrastructure. Is there, first of all, does that assumption need to be corrected and second of all is there um, any future to more 
considerations in land use decision making based on transportation infrastructure on either side of the bridge. Either anyone have a comment? It's really it's a question for Queen Anne's County. Unfortunately, you're the only county yeah, rep up I, there. I, I, I think it's a question for the region. I mean, the growth in Ocean City impacts us. The growth in Delaware Beaches impacts us. The growth in Baltimore, the growth in Anne Arundel County. The 27.2 million trips coming through here are through trips. I mean, you look at our transportation system, it's set up for through trips to get people across the bridge, through the county, to these other destinations. So mm -hmm. I think the, the growth in all of those areas weigh into the situation. Rob, well, could I address that as well? The question was really about whether, uh, as you think about development, you should think about the impacts on transportation. I think the answer is yes. One of the points I was trying to make earlier, I'm not sure I was particularly articulate, is the type of development also will have an impact on transportation. And I think development is often sort of viewed as, as, or the choice between different kinds of economic development is viewed somewhat neutrally. Um, and that's, that's really a point, a, a mindset you have to change. And, and I would argue that certain forms of economic development, including infrastructure for agriculture and the like, will have as much economic benefit with the less transportation impacts and less other adverse impacts. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It really is, and Steve, too. I think it's a holistic, we have to think about this in a holistic regional way. It's economy, it's our quality of life, it's community, it's safety, all of that. And I think that is the, uh, the conundrum with the Bay Bridge, and that is that even development projects that I've seen that are forced to do transportation impact studies, it's always local transportation impact studies, but you have a thousand communities that are making decisions that impact the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, which is a real mid-Atlantic regional infrastructure piece, and uh, all of those decisions need, need to be considering the impacts on the Ch Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and we're just not set up that way. So I, I think it's a really tough question that goes at the core of our constitutional separation of powers in government and who has land use authority. And uh, Let me just add a, a, a kind of a political science point to this. Um, I think we're facing a time when we're looking at uh, whether the, the model of development that was there in the 50s, 60s, 70s continues to be a popular way of thinking about the future. Uh, and to the extent that people say to themselves, how can, I, how can I hold public officials accountable for making it easy for me to get in my car and get to work or get wherever else I want in the, in the least amount of time? That's the dynamic. Uh, then it becomes really hard to see how to sustain that over time, uh, both from just a, a tax point of view, uh, an environmental point of view, and the like. And what you see when you kind of drill down is this, this is a, a political ideological question. Uh, by and large, uh, liberals are much more, at least in theory, amenable to public transit kinds of approaches, the densification, right? You start talking about densification in a, in a conservative crowd and uh, you'll be run out of town. And so uh, there's a mindset about the nature of the future and what can be done as, as a feasible model of development that has you know these consequences and i'm not sure that uh, the, the public is sufficiently mature in understanding of the interrelationship between all these parts and and might prefer just mm -hmm. to hold you accountable to to keep the old system going as long as possible mm -hmm. yeah. i think you're right Any, anyone else from the panel I, I think that's right on and we've all gotten used to cheap transportation infrastructure that really works well and it's allowed us to live above our above our means I would say from a carbon standpoint or from a land use and it's hurt farming it's hurt farmland it's hurt the environment the air the global temperatures it's hurt everything and sort of we're not going to make that pivot to a more sustainable world today um, but I do think these big questions like when you're talking about billions of dollars in infrastructure spending those are the big questions where we make the modest turns over time, and I think uh, this will be one of them for this region. And 
like the slides that were up there about the ferry system, it obviously doesn't seem like there's any cost effectiveness in building a ferry system. But if we had solid towns that were thriving, that had transportation infrastructure within those towns and they were walkable and bikeable, it might be much more realistic to think uh, that a ferry system that just dumped passengers didn't have to carry cars, weren't so car dependent. Uh, the economics of it changed significantly. So we are in the midst of, some, of a transition on this planet away from, or at least in this country, away from the largesse and the consumption of the past to something that's going to have to be a much more lean future for us. But man, it's going to be painful uh, to get there. And the, I think the saving grace is that the millennials, anyone call themselves a, a millennial in this room? There's a couple, Darius, Dan, of course. <laughs> Jack, yes, right. <laughs> but the millennials that, I mean, we, we do, a, we, we're very lucky that, that Darius's generation, they want to come work for us and they've already drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, they don't, many of them, my nieces and nephews don't own cars. They live in the city, they love it, got their coffee shops and, and I think that's, uh, that's a much more easy uh, footprint for each of us to consider for the future. Easier on the planet, easier on our communities, easier on our infrastructure. And it's uh, old guys like me, uh, it'd be tough, but uh, I'm encouraged by the new generation. Oh, here's a question that's addressed to Steve, Cah or Steve Cahoon and Dan Nataf. How have the counties or people had to adopt or adapt to Bay Bridge traffic particularly on costs of Bay Bridge traffic. Any insights on that, on how people have adapted, other than what we've already said? Well, I think, yeah, um, what we're hearing now is more people stay home. We're hearing that businesses close on Sunday because locals aren't patronizing because of the congestion. Um, I think, uh, you know, altering travel times, making sure you get, um, where you're going in time. Uh, the uncertainty of the bridge, like incidents that happened yesterday, weigh into that. And so people are allowing for more time. And, um, you know, I, th I think people are changing their habits to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on the Western Shore, uh, the impacted areas of backups are in, in uh, St. Margaret's and part of Arnold, and as you get closer to the bridge itself. And people, uh, certainly they have adapted by complaining more um, <laughs> because there's so much cut through traffic and they want to get police to check and make sure you're a local person and not somebody who's trying to get to the last entrance onto, the, onto Route 50 before it crosses over. And so, uh, <clears throat> um, and that probably affects over time property values and the propensity for people to want to live in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Um, next question, and Steve, you hinted at this a little bit, touched on it, but there might be more here. Has technology like Google Maps or Waze helped uh, congestion management or made it worse? Um, made it worse in our experience with the uh, Bay Bridge in summer Sundays, um, where Waze and, and those type of Google Maps can be very effective pointing out alternative routes it works where you have alternative routes. Where you don't have alternative routes from Y Mills to uh, Route 2 on, in Anne Arundel County, um, it's putting people um, off of 50, onto 18, down 18, back onto 50. Um, it's putting people deep into our neighborhoods. You know, if, if you can come up 18, go up into Cloverfields, come over to Love Point Road, and it's directing people in some, in some very, um, bad ways. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's putting um, people through intersections. You know, the local knowledge, some people know what intersections aren't the safest or what intersections um, you have to be careful of when you're going through. Waze will direct people there. You know, coming out and across the highway at Chesapeake College is one example. 18 down at the outlets. You know, we've seen people using that technology um, trying to make a left onto 18 at the outlet center, backing up into the main line of, of 50, just because their phone's telling them to. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, 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 
it's bad when you don't have alternative routes, and it, it creates more problems than it helps in our experience. Hmm. Anything else on technology? Well, I'll just mention one thing, just because I was so excited about it, but one of the speakers we looked at was from UCLA, your alma mater, right? Um, traffic, and look, there's a, there's a professor out there looking hard at Uber and other rideshare services in the future of transit, and just uh, the ability of those uh, looks like is going up significantly. So the idea no one's look, really looked at that I could find this could it help a lot in the reach the beach situation, but clearly you, if you could sell a seat in your car and take another car of the road, sell a seat for $15 to Ocean City on the way down, those kind of market-based solutions could be a piece of this, it seems to me anyway. They're out there, they're working, you know, they're driving cabs out of business in major cities, so there, there is a utility in it. And, the next, maybe not everybody in here, but the next generation uses those apps. Even I use Uber sometimes. So it's, uh, I think there's a lot of potential that we don't understand well yet. Here's a question. How is Maryland doing in receiving funding for ITS or intelligent transportation systems through the FAST Act? Does anyone have any sense of that? A little bit technical. This question about Eastern Shore versus Western Shore. We're very parochial over here. Uh, how do we get the Western Shore seeing that it's not just a summertime issue? Uh, I don't know, Dan, if you have already, anything. It already appreciates that. The data shows they're perfectly willing to have a transit system come from the Eastern Shore and, and connect uh, into the Western Shore in a multitude of ways as long as you're willing to pay for it. It's just not willing to pay for it, that's true. That, that's, that's always the, I mean, we saw the big ticket numbers that we were throwing up earlier. And, and so, the, you know, the, there's a predisposition that says that surely can help uh, until the tax bill comes in and they say, well, let's revert back to our old mm -hmm. model and just kind of mm -hmm. grin and bear. And, Right, agreed. When I encourage folks, and Darius will talk more about this, but there is a film at lunch by Bob Eisinger about the High Road Foundation and their push to get more monorail. And they're working in a DC situation, so there's different, uh, there's different volume and economics underneath it, but it's very interesting for the future and it's very compelling. Uh, any other thoughts on Western Shore, Eastern Shore issues? I think there's more of a recognition of it because of using the corridor more often. It's not just a summer thing anymore. Um, we're seeing uh, traffic up and down the corridor um, early spring and into the fall. You know, and, and uh, different tourism destinations are planning events based on that to draw people here. So um, I, I think that people are understanding it because they're traveling that road more and more. Yeah, agreed. Um, question about Question about a new bridge. If you build a new bridge, uh, does anyone have a sense of where the backups would move to? And I know this isn't right in your bailiwick, but we assume you know, if, you, if, you build a, if you build a new bridge here, it'll be more volume coming through here, it'll be bigger backups at Y Mills or something like that. Do you have any sense of that, Steve? Uh, um, what? It depends on where the bridge is and what, what, what's going on, but one of our concerns is wherever a, another bay crossing ends up, if it's not here, it has to be in a location that helps our situation, you know, that it takes, mm -hmm. that it, it's in a location that would divert enough. If, if it doesn't divert enough traffic away from this corridor, if it's in a different location, and we continue to have this problem, we haven't really gotten anywhere. Mm. Agreed. Anything else there? So there's a general growth management question here. This is maybe for John. Uh, but increased strip and big box retail in many communities on both sides of the bay. Uh, what can those local communities do to reorient their development patterns to avoid increasing the congestion on the artery? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, 
I mean, I think, going back to what I was saying before, I think part of the problem here is the need to sort of switch our perspective and think about there can be different forms of development that do serve society. And to be honest, retail is good in a place like this because you want people to be able to get their services here without going somewhere else. So uh, just to be very clear about it, American Farmland Trust is not about uh, against development, never has been. It's about putting development in the right place and preventing it from the places that are very special resources that should be used for other purposes. So I think my simple answer to that question, without knowing the, uh, exactly where, where, where the questioner was, was wanting me to go, is it's all about smart growth. It's, it's not about saying no to anything. It's about putting things in the right places and having an overall economic development plan which is sustainable for a region that doesn't require continued new condo development or whatever ad infinitum being with transportation services or other things being paid elsewhere. Which is part of the reason why I come back to farming. And the farming makes sense for this region. You have the infrastructure, you have great land, it's a huge resource, it is an economic engine that doesn't require those extras that are going to continue and only increase to burden the local community. Mm -hmm. I like to hear that. Well, I'm going to take uh, moderator's prerogative and uh, start to wrap up. I'm going to give each of you maybe a minute or so to make a final statement, and, uh, and then we'll get some logistics up here on lunch. And not to put you on the spot, but how about you, Rich, and we'll just go down the line. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I mean, it's, it's a big deal for what we do every day. It's, it's a hard what we do every day. The traffic is a big deal. But we're also smart about it, and everybody else is smart about it. You know you have traffic, what do you do? You plan accordingly. You adjust accordingly, right? Ways in that side of it, I totally get routed. We got crazy trucks that get routed all over the place, and all I hear is, that's what ways took me, right? Well, we, we got to be better than that. But as, uh, as far as the opportunity of what we're trying to do, and talk about development and everything else, we're looking at other ways to bring back our trucks are coming back empty. What can I put on a truck to take another truck off the road? Why do I have to have you know, empty trucks passing each other? One of them didn't need to be there. So we're looking at all sorts of other opportunities that we can do from a business model as well as just pure efficiency. So thank you again. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, Queen Anne's County is interested in looking at any option that's available. Um, and we, want, we need to look at them with MDOT, Maryland Department of Transportation. Um, so we need to um, have better communications, a different structure of communicating with them, a different way and more ways um, to sit down and work through the issues. Um, we've talked about maybe a regional um, approach to uh, coordinating with them. Um, we, we keep putting ideas on the table and, and we're trying to get to the low hanging fruit. Can we notify um, people before they leave so that they know what the situation is and they can alter their plans? Um, can we have um, more uh, information about the bridge out there in, in regular time so people know whether there's wind restrictions, range restrictions, whether contraflow isn't working. Um, you know, we, we think those are good ideas. We think that, um, uh, you know, looking at the efficiency of contraflow, having, having some, a, a professional firm that has looked at contraflow in many other locations and how it works and the structure of it uh, would be helpful to make it more efficient. Um, you know, we're um, signage, you know, we're all for signage, but people see it a couple times and they drive right by it. So um, we're uh, active management strategies. Can, can we uh, work with the technology of timing um, uh, lights or act, you know, monitoring that traffic in, in real time and adjust accordingly? We think um, there's, there's a lot of strategies out, out there that can be used without a whole lot of money. We're interested in doing that while we're seeing what happens. Good, good, yeah. We should get into some of that this afternoon. How about Dan? Well, I, I encourage you to hire the Center for the Study of Local Issues to do a poll <laughs> on the Eastern Shore and not just the Western Shore. There you are. We've actually, done, we've actually worked for you in the past, so we can do this again, and then we could find out a lot more about people's predispositions to all the imaginative options that you just discussed. Everything from farm preservation to uh, you know having odd times for commutes and really whether or not they're whether they, whether they see the future more in cr 
creating a sustainable uh, economy independently of the western shore, whether that's even a concept that they have, because if it is, that will redirect the way you think about you know, what to do about the, the Bay Bridge. You might just be able to make life so happy and wonderful here, but is that something they're thinking, or are they just saying, you know, the, the jobs and the money are on the other side, make it possible for me to get across? It'd be interesting to do a little comparison. That would be interesting. Nice pitch. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> now about you, John. Last word. Well, I'm sure a number of you are wondering why someone uh, has been up here today talking about farmland protection, the loss of farmland, and the like, in a conference that's primarily about, about uh, traffic congestion. But I hope I've conveyed a few thoughts that get into your mind. These issues are all interconnected. And the point that Rob has made, and I think the other panelists have made, is that the future demands that we think about these things as a system, and just to build off what Dan was saying, I think he's absolutely right. What you really need is a economic development model for the Eastern Shore that is going to be sustainable. And that will potentially um, take away and have you think completely different about some of these transportation issues. And um, as I noted, I would argue that um, part of that future, a big part of that economic future, could and should be agriculture. Mm. Well said. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>